so this, um, the rest of the morning session should be really great. We have this nice kind of um, trio of CO2 um, cleaning talks. And our first speaker is Nancy Odegaard. Um, Nancy, I, I'm going to make this brief so we can get to the talk. Um, <laughs> Nancy is a conservator and head of the preservation division at the Arizona State Museum in Tucson, and um, she just recently received an honorary doctorate from the University of Gothenburg in, Swe in Sweden and has done lots of wonderful projects, and so let's hear Nancy talk about investigations using liquid CO2 to clean textiles in basketry. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. I thought everybody might need a break, <laughs> so like me. Um, so I did that. I do want to make one reference to the last talk. I did work for many years with the uh, National Natural History Museum uh, and their move and lots of objects. It's great fun. I love all of them. The moccasins do look at them. I just want to explain that when we started working on them, there was no dimension. So when you look at those, you have to imagine that they once looked like cow pies with a lot of dirt. The other thing is the, the picture of the turkey feather robe and the rabbit skin robe. Those were not open. Those were full of soil and a mass that had to be really deciphered and figured out. So aside from that, really enjoy the museum. Oh, there's so many wonderful, wonderful objects. So the... Um, talk today is about CO2 snow cleaning. The technique I'm talking about is distinctly different from the ones we're going to hear about next. Um, this is for soft materials. And um, just a disclosure, this, this, is based, uh, this talk is based primarily on a talk that was given at the Smithsonian, a symposium in 2015. And Julie Wolf also gave a talk there. And those talks are available on YouTube. So um, at the end, you'll see a, a note, and you can see other talks that were in that session. Um, all right. Um, I was introduced to the idea of CO2 cleaning by Dr. Werner Zimt, my longtime dear volunteer. Um, and in 2007, we were working on some novel ideas for possible removal of pesticides. We'd already been working experimentally with supercritical CO2 under an NCPTT grant. And Werner actually remembered that liquid CO2 was being used to clean the telescope mirrors at the University of Arizona and thought we should try it uh, for dry pesticide removal techniques on object surfaces. Um, astronomers had been using the technique for some time to overcome scratching and fracturing that would be a problem for their, their mirrors using other techniques, cloths and so on. So we um, considered several types of gas and the use of um, ice pellets as cleaning possibilities. We liked the idea of the CO2 snow particles um, because they could transfer and displace uh, particles of surface soiling. What you have to understand is liquid CO2 expands at a high velocity. It surrounds the particles in a kind of a gas envelope and then slides across the object surface and then the CO2 volatilizes into the air. And so it is a momentum transfer and displacement system that's dry, non-conductive, non-abrasive, and non-toxic. Werner had become familiar with um, Dr. Stuart Honing, who was the retired professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Arizona. And it had been his idea of introducing the technology to the astronomers in the mid 80s. Where, uh, Stuart agreed to come over to the conservation lab and allowed us to borrow his portable equipment um, his lit CO2 tank and his nozzle. Unfortunately, the nozzle he had was broken, and um, Stewart's cognitive abilities were failing pretty bad. So that was our only chance to meet with him. Um, I was particularly interested in this technology because we were beginning a large basketry project that uh, has come to involve 35,000 specimens. Um, and I knew we had a lot of museum dust. We'd been cleaning pottery vessels, and you can see a pot up there, for several years, and um, 
using, you know, brush, brush vacuum, and so on. And there were certain aspects of that cleaning method that were undesirable that we wanted to see if we could improve. So um, we began working with the CO2, finding that it was inert, gentle, colorless, odorless, cheap, easily available, and uh, started experimenting. We were using liquid carbon dioxide that has a siphon or a dip tube in the tank and um, proceeded. Uh, after an initial testing of several successful examples, we sought uh, out a new nozzle and, learned, and I learned that Hugh Shockey uh, at the National Museum of American Art had also purchased a similar nozzle and he was cleaning museum objects. And I was able to go to Washington on a visit and visit with Hugh and look at his setup. He's using a, or at the time there, was using a dual gas nozzle that included nitrogen as a kind of a uh, moisture displacement uh, aspect. Hugh had given a talk in 2009 at AIC, but I hadn't heard that, and the object group postprints had not been published. So I, I really didn't know what his work was about, but he was so gracious, gave me a draft copy of his paper, and um, I did end up using this technique initially on a, um, many of the 500 baskets that went into our, our, our exhibition in 2012 and was a kickoff to a Save America's Treasure project that we're still working on. Um, unlike Hugh, working in Washington, D.C., I was working in Tucson, and I didn't find condensation to be a significant problem. <laughs> I don't think we have it here either. Um, our relative humidity is actually a lot lower, closer to 25% on a good day. Um, and I think we were getting very good results because, A, we were really trying to remove desert, dry desert particulates, uh, and the basketry surfaces did have some structural stability. And many of the basketry items had a cuticle, leaf cuticle, or a, a woody bark in place that gave it a little more strength. Also, the surface temperature of basketry and textiles is not like metals. Uh, it's, it's not going to be very thermally conductive, so we didn't have that cold transferring. Um, also, it appeared that the surfaces were able to withstand the force of the jet. So the soft surface of basketry did not seem to absorb the snow particles, nor did we get a de redeposition of the dust. So, experimenting. Um, other projects on the calendar and my own uncertainty about how to make museum dust and how to quantify an application of this technique and its removal, how to report a testing system, which was kind of, that looks good, that looks good, you know, that I was having trouble with that. So I delayed working on this for a couple years. Um, I also found that uh, I was perceiving that my different tanks of liquid CO2 had a different personality, and that didn't seem very scientific. So um, I, I now believe that there's uh, the possibility of contamination in the, in the tanks. So um, I wasn't, I, was, I caught myself that no, they didn't have a different personality, but yes, there was a different to the, difference to the different tanks. So I'm going to describe how we did a test, um, how we figured out that this technique was going to be a method that we wanted to use. So first I purchased a basketry hat, brand new, from Ikea, uh, and proceeded to cut it up into 13 pieces. I used a sewing machine to secure the plated weave structure, and then I roughened up all both surfaces with sanding paper and uh, dusted that off with compressed air. They were then, each of the pieces were labeled using a Sharpie pen to indicate the piece, the side, and the location of four circles that I drew, drew in, you can see there with the template, um, to mark my location spots for comparison. Each piece was photographed under identical conditions of position and lighting using a copy stand and a Verilux uh, daylight bulbs. I used a dyno light for the micro photographs of each circle. A recipe 
of known components for synthetic or artificial dust was adapted to reflect particulate and fiber fractions found in museum dust. Uh, there's a patent article dated in 2001 called Artificial Dust Composition and Method of Manufacture uh, that we used as the basis of our recipe. The raw materials were gathered and prepared to suitable fineness and volume. For example, it was necessary to bake plant materials in an oven and then grind them up with a mortar and pestle prior to sieving. Natural and synthetic fibers needed to be cut and um, things like uh, Sokla flock or cellulose fiber I was able to take out of a jar. Skin was particularly difficult um, to obtain enough, so after scraping everybody in the lab's heels and getting some cow rawhide, uh, we went to rabbit skin glue. <laughs> the particles dry uh, to get the necessary volume. The particulate components of talc, starch, and carbon were pretty easy to pull out of the jar and measure, and a number 10 standard test sieve was used to reduce the particle size for some of the components. The components were assembled and mixed in a geological lab blender. The published particulate sizes for dust suggest that under 10% of your mixture should be 75 microns, 10 to 20 percent. Um, should be between 75 and 300 microns, and 60 to 80 percent should be over 300 microns. So most of the components in our artificial dust were less than 100 microns, so that's what we ended up using. In a museum environment, it's less likely for large particles to travel, and there's more likely to just fall to the floor rather than just move around on objects. So one article on museum dust suggested an annual accumulation of about 1.3 grams per meter squared is common in museums. I live in a desert. Um, for distribution onto the samples, we referred to an ASTM standard that was called accelerated soiling of pile yarn, yarn floor covering and used Tupperware saltine cracker containers as our tumbler. Five grams of our artificial dust were measured into the tumbler and for each sample, and each sample was tumbled for, 12, for two minutes, one minute forward, one minute backward. We see we're interested in what the mixture of artificial dust looked like chemically, and FTIR identified only the larger components of our inorganic uh, composition, sort of the, the clays and the organic cellulose we could see. And this compared similarly to compositional studies on household dust. We used FTIR to uh, compare household vacuum dust with our artificial dust. And as expected, there's more protein in ho household dust than you would expect to find in the museum. Weights were taken of each sample piece at each phase of the testing, first prior to the dusting, second after the dusting, third after the cleaning. And we used a Mettler analytical balance and had to rig it so we had a little container there to keep it from flopping over using pipe, pipe cleaners or the construction. Um, I considered um, accelerated aging um, strategies. I knew that dusty surfaces um, that have experienced ex moisture events are gonna be harder to clean. That does kind of solidifies a little bit. And I opted to then humidify in an environment of about 90% uh, relative humidity for eight hours. And that actually ended up rising in our, our glove box chamber to almost 99. And then uh, placing, I did this by placing the samples above a deionized water bath and monitoring with uh, thermal hygrometers. Following the humidification, a lab oven was used to heat dry the samples at 99 degrees C for 20 hours. And then finally, the dusted and aged samples were documented with macro and micro photographs. Each was half covered with aluminum foil. They were randomly assigned to a cleaning procedure. Some were gonna be brushing, some were gonna be brush vacuuming, and some would have CO2 snow cleaning. 
One sample of plain basketry and one sample of basketry with textiles were each assigned to each the brush and the brush vacuuming technique. A control sample was previously identified and isolated from the whole procedure. A control sample, um, but the whole control sample was subjected to the heating uh, and humidity uh, aging, but it was not dusted. Sample number one in the whole group, there were 13, so sample number one was um, maintained just as a cis, experimental handling piece. We were able to work out handling in the, met, in the, in the balance, uh, photographic setup, weighing procedure, um, and so on. Just It was used as the tool for working out all of that that would not modify the others. The cleaning methods for the brush and the brush vacuuming followed the techniques that were standard in our lab. The brushes were fan-shaped, um, nylon blender brushes, artist brushes. Um, the vacuum was a portable dental vacuum set at medium suction with dust collected in a water chamber. And the water chamber, the water was examined, uh, was not filtered, but we did examine it later. It had a kind of a similar quantity. The CO2 cleaning method was the same as what we'd used in previous trials. The pressure was at 60 uh, PSI. The distance from the sample was about 6 to 10 inches, and a dust collector was used. In my experience, uh, smooth, quick strokes with the nozzle work best for cleaning, and the direction is towards the extractor and away from the cleaned area. The aluminum foil was removed, and the macro photographs were taken of before and after cleaning surfaces for each sample. Weights were taken for each sample and added to an Excel spreadsheet so that the data could be compared. It's a comparison technique. So this chart compares the cleaning effectiveness by percent of dust mass removed. The blue indicates the sample with only basketry, and the red indicates the sample of basketry with textile. So you can see some kind of comparables that if you've done cleaning, kind of makes sense with brushing, what you might expect, and brush vacuuming, and the, the CO2, though, is the impressive one. The other important aspect was that the time for cleaning of each sample was collected with a phone stopwatch and recorded on the Excel spreadsheet. So this chart compares the cleaning time, and again, the blue is the own basket only, and the red is the basketry with textile and you can see um, how the cleaning time was improved with the CO2. So our FTI spectra of the dusted sample surface and the CO2 clean sample surface indicate that some dust is still detectable on the surface, but it's less visible to the human eye. So just kind of a set of photos here, macro photo documentation of basketry sample two cleaned by brushing. Note there is a 52.2% dust mass removed, 53.2. Uh, macro photograph, uh, micro photograph documentation of sample two allows you to see the structural and surface changes from the cleaning technique. Um, and so I think you can, you can see that some of the um, damaged areas that are um, already in the basketry are really not changed. Macro photographs of the basketry tech with textile sample number 12 was just cleaned by brushing. Note that um, only 44.3% dust was removed. Up close, the microphoto documentation clarifies, again, the level of um, disturbance, change we might be concerned about fairly minimal. Um, this is sample 11, cleaned with brush and vacuum. This is 52.1%. There's more cleaned off with the brush vac technique. And again, looking at the micro photographs and looking at where, uh, how much change there is. Okay, now with uh, basketry 13, sample 13, this is with the CO2 snow and we're getting 74.4% cleaning. Uh, up close, you can see a pretty 
good, remarkable difference uh, that's clarifying how much structural and surface change would take place. So I want to say that um, the non-textile and the textile surface allowed us to kind of see, you can see where the, some of the, um, my stitching with the sewing machine that sort of held it in place suffered a little bit. Uh, but that could have been from the roughening um, or other means. I don't think the, the snow did that. Um, here's kind of a group sample of the, the circles showing the brush technique and the brush back and the CO2 together as a comparison. And just a few examples of cleaning other basketry. Um, items, working with three-dimensional objects. Um, here you can see kind of a bit of a line. I guess it's with the cleaned. Here there's uh, perhaps right here you can see. It can be fairly dramatic and very, very quick. This object here uh, is a very, very important object, another part of a, almost another study. And there's more going on than just the dust. But the, the dust and the loose surface dust what made a dramatic difference. And now it's possible to go back in and do a uh, more refined cleaning. This was an example early on in the work with a textile. This we didn't think was a real object. Turns out it does have a catalog number. It was made by a famous anthropologist, so it's kind of got a little story. It had fallen behind a cabinet. It was completely gray. Had no idea there was uh, color. And so just to be able to get this, uh, this coloring uh, back is pretty remarkable. Otherwise, it was gray. Um, always a concern about dry pigments, matte pigment surfaces. This is a Tonatam Kiho, and um, just again where the arrow is, I think you can see pretty dramatic. We also have done this where we were comparing and collecting if there was dry pigment that came off. We have not seen that. It's been very, very gentle. Um, this is porcupine quill on birch bark with sweet grass. Again, fairly dramatic, changes very fast, safer. I do wear a dust mask when I do most of the work. And of late, we have started using a CO2 monitor. Um, these are available. Um, and it, having the monitor has allowed us to pivot and change our configuration. So we open a door that we hadn't been opening before, and it just kind of tells us how we're doing. Um, as I said, the uh, other talks on this topic are available online at the top. You can just look at ice cold seminar, and it tends to come up very quickly on Google. And all of my lab folks that uh, helped me with this project and continue to do so, I really appreciate. So thank you very much. <laughs>
for some white powder that was, is on a book. And just last night, I got a report back from him. But he had given us a little, uh, what they must use in forensics, uh, you know, out in the field is a little device and then it's got a filter in there and they easily capture, you know, whatever it is. Right, and we can, we can do that with a couple techniques when we're doing the analytical study. With pesticides, I was definitely doing, using that technique. This would be a little messier for that. I, I'm not sure I would use this technique for pesticide removal at this time. Um, you were analyzing the, um, the artificial dust that you were making. Yeah. Have you analyzed the uh, actual dust on your objects, and how does it compare? If so? um, just a little bit. That's, uh, we have done a little bit on that. Um, kind of hard. With, you know, it's like you vacuum, and then you analyze the vacuum bag. What what's, was a surprise to me is just how much protein. I mean, humans are like making most of the dust out there, and there's just hair and skin and debris all over the place. Um, so I would say that I, my artificial, my artificial recipe where it was a little high on clay, uh, soil particle, um, but that's a lot easier to get and measure. Um, so similar, but um, I haven't really made dust a big research project. <laughs> um, I obviously need to watch some more of your videos and uh, do a little more research on this, but have you used this cleaning method for organic material, uh, on organic material to remove other sorts of soiling, um, old adhesives, or anything else besides dust? Other people have done some great work uh, looking at it on plastics and so on. Uh, Randy, in fact, has uh, bothered me a couple times with, happily bothered me a couple times with um, questions of, on paper. And so looking at some things like with uh, soot and more oily, type material, sort of grimy, really tenacious. That doesn't work quite as well. We can see an improvement, but we're talking about changing, say, something that would, in my case, with this basketry, might be um, five to ten, five minutes doing a brush vac on a basket and going to less than a minute. So in terms of, and having better efficiency and not actually physically manipulating the surface. So the any kind of loose little fibers where the, the basketry has got little splinters on it, where a brush or a vacuum could actually dislodge that, that's not happening with this. So I think it's really a, a valuable technique. It's not for everything, um, but it's really efficient. And a lot of the basketry, that little curly cues, you just can't get in there. This was, this was a nice, uh, safe way to do it. Great, thank you.